What? Dude, what? What? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, morning worship. Not a lot going on today, and uh, good to be here on Palm Sunday. We're going to uh, our call to worship this morning, and we're going to reprise the song that we learned last week. We close with it by Tony Melendez. You are my God, you're my Lord, and you are my King. Good morning. 
Good morning. Um, well, a uh, several days of cold and dark rain, uh, followed by a uh, beautiful sunshine morning. Yeah. Feels like Easter. Um, so uh, if you're visiting with us today, uh, we're happy to have you. Um, and um, I hope you can join us across the street for a fellowship afterwards. Um, and uh, hello to all the folks that are down there right now. Um, so uh, let me open a word of prayer, and then we have a little special guest. All right. Uh, dear Lord, um, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love and your grace um, and the sacrifice of your son that we celebrate each day, but in a special way uh, in this season, Lord. I ask you to uh, bring us all together in song and in worship to you this morning, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds and prepare us for the message we're about to receive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Come on up. Good morning. My name is Bob Garzetta, and along with Pete McFarland, um, we uh, teach the uh, third, fourth, and fifth grade Sunday school class. And um, if your kids or grandkids or anyone you know that uh, is not um, uh, enrolled in the, in the class, we welcome them. Uh, so you just bring them, and they don't necessarily have to be every class. They'll fit right in if they're here and there from uh, week to week. So we just welcome them. Um, uh, consider it if you know somebody that would like to come. Um, Emma uh, is one of our, our stars in the class, and uh, she's just a wonderful, wonderful young lady. And she um, asked if she would read uh, scripture this morning, and the scripture she selected was from John chapter 20, and she'll be reading from verse 11 uh, to the end, uh, uh, verse 18. And in your pew Bibles, it's found in 1087. So if you want to go there and follow along, um, she is a wonderful young lady. She, uh, uh, she holds us accountable um, with her uh, inquisitiveness and um, her, uh, her, her Bible uh, focus. And uh, just, uh, she's just a joy to have in class. So she's going to read from the scripture. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood at the tomb, outside of the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. She he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So great to hear a young person read God's word. Amen. Let's stand for worship this morning. Let's shout it from the rooftop. Call all your friends. Put it on social media. Jesus saves. Hallelujah. Here we go. Yeah. 
morning to somebody next to you this morning.
Good morning. Oh, the wonderful cross. Thank you, Lord. I was thinking about it this week. Isn't it kind of an irony, the, the implement of torture and death we celebrate? We wear it as a symbol of what Jesus did for us. And uh, hallelujah. The old rugged cross. Amen. Coffee and food will be today across the street, as Nate mentioned, and he'll be in the pastor's office for just a little while for one-on-one -on -one prayer, if you would like that, so uh, take advantage of that. The Sunday night gathering, our Sunday night group will meet tonight at 6.30. Join us for that if you're able. And Resurrection, Resurrection Weekend coming up, Good Friday, 7 p.m. We'll have uh, a service right here in the church, and it will be uh, communion service. And then Sunday morning, we'll have sunrise service. We'll meet next door, and we'll go up on top of the hill for uh, a brief little sunrise service, and then we'll come back down and have some coffee and refreshments followed by the 10 o'clock month. But uh, it'll be a, a little bit more of a celebration than normal. So, uh, so there you go. Rich Biot uh, was with some of the men uh, at the men's retreat this weekend. Rich, you wanted to say a word to these people this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm part of the uh, Amen's Ministry of the Church, and if anybody doesn't know who the Amen's Ministry is, it's a group of men from the church who meet once a month uh, down at the gymnasium at 7 o'clock on the first Saturday of the month. So, you know, we had, a, we had a retreat this weekend, which was an amazing, it is always an amazing time when a group of men from the church get together or, you know, I was thinking, we, I'm sitting here talking about the men's ministry, but yet we have such, 
so many wonderful ministries in the church, and I'm sure that all the ministries, whether it's a, a, a Bible study, whether it's the morning glories, whether it's you know the ladies who, who uh, pray on Wednesday, uh, so many, the, the, the Sunday school teachers, it's just amazing uh, what these people and what I get out of being with other people in the church and getting to know other people in the church. So this weekend, we had a great time. We had 17 men. Uh, we were up at Huntersfield, which is an amazing place. If anybody's ever been there, it's the, the, the beauty of it, the fields. And, the, and uh, you know, we were sitting there, and there was a bobcat running across the field. You know, you don't know what you're going to see up there. It's great. So, you know, so all the men, I'm going to speak for all the men, you know, as I watched. It's amazing how you get up in the morning, and, you know, you're all groggy, and you come downstairs, and everybody's having coffee, and they're talking, and, you know, groups of guys would get together, and there'd be another group of guys together. It was just, it's pretty wild to watch, and it's pretty wild to, to, to participate in such a thing as that. Uh, you know, I was fortunate I had two of my boys come, so, I, you know, I was pretty happy about that. And uh, so what the retreat was all about, Pastor Tom uh, organized, and, and he uh, led the retreat, and we talked about hypocrisy in the world today. We talked about injustice in the world today and how, how the world is pressing in on us as Christian people. And then last of all, we talked about hope and the hope that Christ, what he did at the cross, uh, what he did for us, that we have inside of us that the world can't take, no matter how what goes on, how much injustice, how much, you know, hate or whatever is in the world, we can hold on to the fact that we have this hope in Christ that one day he'll come for us. So I just wanted to read a, a scripture. It was, it's in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through 12. Paul says, we are hard pressed on every side, not, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be re revealed in our bodies. For we are, we who are alive all, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that this life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is in work in you. So that was a, that was a great message for us and in, in the time we're living in. And so if anybody, you know, decides to participate in a ministry in this church, you're going to get something because God will bless you. God blessed all the men at that retreat yesterday. And we were just so thankful that Pastor Tom, he did such a great job. And it's amazing that God uses people in such an effective way. Amen. And so thank you. Thank you, Rich. And Roy uh, wanted to mention a couple opportunities coming up. Good morning, Roy. Good morning. I'm one of the elders of this church, and I've been a believer in Jesus for many years. So I'm calling out to all the believers here. We have two classes coming up. One class is a membership class. It's important that you're a member of God's church, but you can also be a member of this church. So if you want to be a member of this church, there's a membership class that I'll be leading with Al Stippa uh, in four weeks on April 21st over uh, in, in, the, in the Sunday school room um, over in the education building. If you're a believer and you haven't been baptized, we have another opportunity here. On May 5th, two weeks after the membership class, uh, Al Stippo will be leading a baptism class. It would be the first step here if you wanted to be baptized here and you haven't been baptized before as a believer. It would be right here. We have a baptism tank right in the front. You wouldn't even know it was here, but there is one here. So those are two opportunities, two classes coming up after Easter. So thank you very much. And if you're interested, contact me or Al Stippa or any one of the elders, actually. And uh, we, al we already have a few people that want to become members here. And we have some membership applications. And we have a few that want to be baptized. So uh, you're welcome, as many as want to come. Amen. Thank you.
Amen.
<laughs> Good morning. Yes, young people can be dismissed. Amongst all those little faces and all those little heads, all those little rascals, we have a new little rascal, sweet little girl back there belonging to the O'Connors. And there she is. <laughs> and, and Dad's not too proud. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for the rain and the sunshine that makes our world green, that reminds us of your provision and your love and that life is yours, a gift given by you. Father, Lord God, speak to our hearts as we ponder your truth again today, the life that you've given to us, the life that you offer to the world. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just reading briefly from John. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things had been written about him, that these things had to be done to him. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. <clears throat> A week before his crucifixion, Jesus came to Jerusalem on a Sunday. This event, which has for centuries been referred to as the triumphal entry, is remembered on Palm Sunday. Sadly, Christ's so-called triumphal entry was short-lived. The same crowd who greeted him as king just days later would demand his execution at the hands of the Romans. How could the virtually the same crowd of people see things so differently in so short a period of time? The answer to the question is simply wrong expectations. Webster's Dictionary defines the word expectation this way. It says, to look forward to the probable occurrence or the appearance of someone or something, to consider likely or certain. On that particular Sunday, the crowd was looking forward to Jesus of Nazareth becoming a warrior king. A warrior king over Israel, like David had been, believing it likely or even certain that he would rally the nation and they would drive out the hated Romans. They expected a glorious victory and then a kingdom more powerful and more wonderful than Solomon's. Their expectations were wrong. They were all wrong. And so in just a few days, when they realized their hopes were not going to materialize, they turned on the man they would have made king. Disappointed, frustrated, and angry. They changed in a moment. Expectations point to the unknown. And so for that reason, they're often mistaken. Husbands and wives have certain expectations of marriage, and therefore certain expectations of each other. And oftentimes, these expectations are unreasonable. And so you get into the marriage a few months or perhaps a few years, 
and you are disappointed with your mate. What a terrible thing to be disappointed in your mate. What a terrible thing it is. For no other reason than you had unreasonable expectations. You expected him to be, you know, perfect. You expected her to be perfect. You expected the whole circumstance of marriage to be blissful and wonderful and easy and perfect and just lovely. And you find out that there are some complications. Parents have certain preconceived notions about their children. And oftentimes their expectations are so high of their children, unintentionally they pressure their children and they hurt their children because they expect their children to be the best children and the smartest children and the children who have the greatest achievements and the children that can do this and can do that. And, 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 and again, it makes for problems. It makes for problems. People have a certain concept of themselves, sometimes doubting their ability or worth. Oftentimes their expectations of themselves are, are too low. Other times their expectations of, of ourselves are, are too high. Uh, we put so much pressure on ourselves, we are doomed to fail. Or we put no pressure on ourselves and we achieve nothing. There are many things that give rise to expectations. Um, holidays, for instance. We look forward to holidays and big events and vacations and graduations and a visit from a special friend or, or a relative, a, a completion of a great project. We look forward to the end of a project. Maybe you're, you're redoing your living room or you're redoing your kitchen. Uh, or we look forward to the attainment of some great goal. Uh, we anticipate receiving our master's degree or a, a doctorate or a PhD. But with all these things, there's a danger that our expectations could be wrong. How many times have you come to a holiday and your expectations are up here? And grandma and grandpa are coming and aunt, you know, Ethel and, and Uncle Bob, and they're all coming and, and you've, you've, you've decorated the house and you've bought all the food and you're fired up and you just got this wonderful thing in mind, and you're going to take pictures, and it just turns out to be a, a horrific, terrible tragedy. And people don't get along, and the food doesn't turn out, and people fight and bicker and carry on, and your expectations were up here are just dashed. Dashed. How many times have you gone on vacation? Oh, dear Jesus, let me go on vacation, and be happy and quiet and have a good time. It's going to be fabulous. We've got a reservation at this restaurant. We're going to go to this and we're going to do that. We're going to see Mickey Mouse and all this great stuff. And then you get down there and somebody starts sneezing and somebody's nose starts to run and somebody doesn't feel good to their stomach and then they eat a giant burrito and get on some ride and all of a sudden the burrito comes back. <laughs> and we just say, you know, why? Why? You know, there's nothing worse than having these, these incredible expectations and then having them dashed. Every four years, <laughs> Americans let their expectations run wild. We'll talk about it in a few weeks. The presidential election's coming. Our expectations are high. Somebody's going to save America. I wouldn't bet on it. Not on either one of those guys. But we'll talk about that later. Because we don't talk about politics much here in church, because we have bigger fish to fry. Bigger fish to fry. All these lofty expectations give rise to a myriad of potential problems. Things like discontentment, frustration, disappointment, even anger. Wrong expectations are often worse than no expectations at all. When Jesus rode the colt into Jerusalem that day, he became the victim of yet one more wrong expectation. And this particular mistake would loom larger and more dangerous than all the things that I've just alluded to. For all the wrong expectations we might have of people or of things in the world, nothing is more destructive than having wrong expectations of God. In a nutshell, 
both believer and sometimes even the skeptic share a common misconception that if God exists, or we think he could exist, or maybe we're not sure that he exists, or maybe he should, or whatever, or doesn't, or, or whatever, that if he exists, he should exist for us. The skeptic believes that. If God exists, he should exist for us. Sadly, many times, the believer believes the same thing. God exists for me. Praise the Lord. Life is wonderful. God takes care of me. He meets all of my needs. He meets all of my expectations all the time. This is our shared mistake. This is our wrong expectation. The same one the people expressed on Palm Sunday. Spreading palm branches, even their clothes on the road before Jesus, they shouted and proclaimed him king. But Jesus would never be the king they were looking for. He was one big disappointment. And it would all come down in just a few days. This same problem, I've, I've, I've often wondered how people must be enormously disappointed when they spend a bazillion dollars, get plane tickets, reservations, and go to the Super Bowl, and their team is destroyed. You imagine the feeling? You know, you got you got your hat on, your you know, your your jersey. You're all fired up, and you're yeah, this is gonna be awesome. And you sit there, and the other team just takes your guys apart. This is how these people felt. They were annoyed. They were mad. They were disappointed. This same problem is often the very thing that keeps people from faith even today. For their question is always the same: What will God do for me? I don't see God doing anything for me. Other, ask, other questions they ask is, is, why doesn't God feed all the poor people? Why doesn't he heal all the sick people? Why doesn't he put an end to all war? If God is good and all-powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in our world? All these questions are rooted in wrong expectation, in the wrong expectation, that, that God exists for us. He doesn't exist for us. We feel that it's God's responsibility to reveal himself to us. But scripture teaches just the opposite, that it's our responsibility. Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. God's not hiding. We're the ones who fail to hear him and to see him. Psalm 19 tells us that the skies proclaim the work of his hands, there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. God speaks to us all, but we're not paying attention. We're not listening. He reveals himself to us, but we're not looking. Paul wrote to the Romans saying that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that humankind is without excuse. God shows himself to us in nature and the wonders of nature and all the creatures that he's made and the forests and the birds and the fish and the trees and all, all of it, he shows himself. <clears throat> but we're not paying attention. We neither see him nor hear him because we are preoccupied with our own concerns. Jesus constantly pointed it out. They have ears and they don't hear, they have eyes and they don't see. What's the problem? Not only do people believe that God exists for them, for their benefit, but that he should, for that reason, be predictable. That he should always aid us in every issue of life, and this is his purpose. These same people pray and speak with great confidence that God will do this or that, and then they are frustrated when he does not do the things they think he should do. I'm not, I'm not going to ask, but here's the question. I'm not asking. I don't want to see any hands. How many times have you been disappointed with God? We shouldn't be disappointed with our spouse. We shouldn't be disappointed with our kids. And we sure shouldn't be disappointed with God. But how many times in the past have we been disappointed with God because he didn't do what Tom Hartley wanted him to do in a given circumstance? 
or insert your name. We've all been disappointed in God from time to time, though none of us would want to admit it. On Palm Sunday, people felt that they knew exactly what God was doing, and so they cheered and they hoped, but God's son, Jesus, did not cooperate. On another day, in another place, Jesus made clear just how ridiculous our expectations of God often are. When he said to the Pharisees, he said, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to each other. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you, and you did not cry. Now, in the immediate context, Jesus was um, criticizing the Pharisees for rejecting both John the Baptist and himself, in the sense that no matter how God offered the truth to them, they rejected it. Uh, Jesus' exact words were, you guys rejected John the Baptist because he was a recluse, and he ate no bread, and he drank no wine, and you said he had a demon. So you dismissed him. Even though he was sharing God's truth, you dismissed him. So I come along, I'm just the opposite. I'm not a recluse. I eat, I drink, and I spend time with people, but you, you say that I'm a glutton and a drunk and a friend of sinners. And so Jesus says this, you've played the flute and we didn't dance. Your expectations were put out there. And it doesn't matter what we do or how we do it, you're disappointed. There's a secondary principle at work in this scripture here in Luke. The Pharisees were playing the flute, expecting Jesus to dance. And many in the crowd on Palm Sunday were doing the same thing. They expected Jesus to be something he was not. To do what they thought he should do, but the Lord would not dance to the tune they were playing. Christian author Martin Lloyd-Jones once wrote that it is fundamental principle in life and the walk of faith that we must always be prepared for the unexpected when we're dealing with God. The unexpected when we're dealing with God. Should God not be free to act in accordance with his divine will or should we expect him to act only in accordance with our expectations and our wishes? We even put together things like theology to try to contain God or put him into a box and say, okay, God will always do this. God will always do that. God will always respond this way. It's called systematic theology. Never much cared for it. I never much cared for it. And I took considerable criticism in Bible college for voicing my opinion. And the reason I never cared for it was, in systematic theology, we presume to say, we've got him figured out. And the day you think you've got him figured out, let me tell you, that's the day you need to look in the mirror and say, I am dead wrong. Because you can't figure him out. He does things the way he wants to do things, when he wants to do things, how he wants to do things. And, and that's what Jones is talking about. Again, God does not exist for us. <clears throat> we exist for him. Bible scholar Oswald Chambers wrote this. He said, God wants us to realize his sovereignty, that he's in charge, that we exist for him. We are apt to tie up God in his own laws and not allow him a free will. What does he mean by that? It, laws aren't made for God. Laws are made for us. God doesn't need laws. God is the law. We say we know what God will do, but suddenly he upsets all our calculations. 
by working in unprecedented ways. Just when we expect he would do a certain thing, he does the opposite. That's the God I know. He's always thrown a curveball or a slider or something else. I expected a fastball right down the middle. The Bible says most of the time he throws fastballs right down the middle. Every once in a while, whoop, he throws this funky knuckleball. All right? Why? Because he's God. He can throw anything he wants. Chambers concludes his thoughts. He says, there are unexpected issues in life. Amen? Does life just like go the way you think it's supposed to go? Is life predictable? If life's not predictable, why, why would we think God would be predictable? There are unexpected issues in life, unexpected joys, when we're looking for sorrow. Sorrow when we expect joy. Until we learn to say, my expectations are from thee, we've got problems. Okay? We are both surprised and disappointed by God because of wrong expectations, because of self-expectations. Chambers observes that it's not until we forsake all these wrong expectations, these ridiculous expectations, thinking that he exists for us, and learn to embrace the reality that we exist for him, it's only then that we'll find peace and joy. Our only expectations of God should be what Scripture teaches us to expect. Not, not that he will beckon to our every whim or spare us pain in every trial, but that he will love us and care for us and lead us through this life into the next. That's all it promises. He'll love us and care for us and lead us in, in, through this life into the next. These are the only things we have a right to expect from him. For these things he promises nothing more Nothing less. On Palm Sunday, many were disappointed. Has Christ disappointed you? When you played the flute, did he refuse to dance? I prayed and prayed and prayed. I prayed in earnest. Scripture told me I could. He did nothing. Are we to accuse God? Are we to be disappointed with God because life doesn't go our way or our prayers for ourselves appear to go unanswered? We forget that God says no. We forget that God says wait. And we assume that God will only ever say yes. Set aside your selfish expectations. Put down your flute. Be honest with him and yourself. Yield to him and you'll find what it is you lack. Okay? It is not wise in any way, shape, or form to put expectations on God. We are to serve God. We are to trust God. And that's enough. Some on Palm Sunday, some, hoped rightly that Jesus would be the Messiah not a warrior king. They hoped in what the scriptures promised. They, unlike the others, were not disappointed. In the weeks and months and years that followed, their faith was rewarded again and again and again. Unlike the others, they waited and they trusted. Trust and wait on him, and it will be the same for you. Trust and wait on him. Pastor Hartley, you don't know what kind of mess I'm in. You don't know what kind of thing I'm suffering. You don't understand the pressure. You don't understand the fear. I understand all those things because I've experienced all those things too. Trust him and wait on him. Lay your expectations aside. Thank him that you're forgiven. Thank him that you have life. Thank him for the sunshine, for your family, for those that you love those who love you. Share the truth with somebody else. But take your expectations and lay them aside. He owes us nothing. He's paid it all. We should be happy about that. And that should be enough. That should be enough.
And we all have the same problem. I do too. I have heaped expectations on him. I, I would be embarrassed to share with you. And at times I was disappointed with him. And I had no right to be. I do better now. I've learned a little bit. I've made a little progress. I just need to love him and trust him. Let's pray. Father, Lord God, bless your people. Encourage each heart and each mind this day. Life offers infinite disappointment, infinite difficulty. But dear Lord, we should never, ever be disappointed in you. We thank you and praise you for all those things you provide that we forget about, that we fail to see, that we fail to remember. Encourage each heart and mind this day. Remind us of just how blessed and how fortunate we are. And help us, dear Lord, to enjoy the life you have provided and to put it good, to good use in sharing your truth. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning.